Thank you for coming, coming out this evening. I just have a, a, a brief announcement uh, before we begin the official program. I just wanted to comment on the fact of uh, Ed Schultz uh, abruptly uh, uh, canceling uh, yesterday. Um, uh, we were disappointed. We're sorry for the people who traveled here to see Ed Schultz that he's not uh, going to be here uh, this evening. Uh, we thought he would be. And the explanation that we got uh, uh, from his people is that he had security concerns. So I just wanted to let you know that that was the reason that they said that he wouldn't be here. And now I'm going to introduce uh, Lorene from uh, All Souls. Hi, um, I'm Laureen Grubert, and I'm a member of the Peace and Justice Task Force uh, and former co-chair co of the Peace and Justice Task Force. Uh, I've been involved with Peace and Justice Task Force since its inception uh, after 9-11, and during that time we've done a lot of really important programs, many of which have been with the Big Apple Coffee Party. Uh, for a number of years, we were just focusing on one issue at a time, such as money and politics or racial justice. But since the election, there's been an intersectionality of issues that people have been concerned about, and so they wanted to address a number of, of issues. So membership has increased, and committees have been formed, such, um, and some of them are immigration and uh, uh, climate change, mass incarcerations. So this is, um, we'll be, they'll be starting up new programs again in the fall, but this year for the, for the first time, they're going to be doing a, um, a summer film series and there'll be some, there's some, um, some uh, programs in the back for people to, um, to take with them if they're interested. And if you like what you hear and you're not on our mailing list, there's also, also sign up and we'll, you can take advantage of some of the, the programs in the future. I also wanted to mention that this is a free program as are most of our programs, but anybody who would like to donate anything, there are baskets in the back and they would be very much appreciated. And most importantly, we're, we're very happy that the Big Apple Coffee Party has brought this event to the peace, with the Peace and Justice Task Force. It's a timely issue that many of us are very concerned about. So I'd like now to turn the program over to Alan Bailey, who's with the Big Apple Coffee Party, to tell you something about them. Uh, thank you, Lorene, and All Souls Unitarian Church. Big Apple Coffee Party and Peace and Justice Task Force of All Souls Unitarian Church have had a long and fruitful relationship putting on forums going back to 2010. From our first forum, should corporations decide our elections, to our last one, unfinished business, freeing, freeing ourselves from racism. Our original mission was to try and eliminate the corrosive effects of money in the political sphere. That notion is probably more valid today than it was seven years ago. We are committed to civil discourse and acting independently of political parties. Over the years, we have felt the need to branch out and deal with a wider range of issues. Currently, we are under assault from many directions as issues we thought that have been settled are under attack. Big Apple Coffee Party has always felt that part of its mission was to educate ourselves and our community. We feel that if there is something we are interested in, there is probably a broader public that would be interested too. This forum tonight on fake news continues part of our mission. We feel that we have put together an expert group of speakers and moderator to explore this topic. Our moderator, Margaret Kimberly, is editor and senior columnist at Black Agenda Report. 
She is a regular guest on radio and internet talk shows and has appeared on Al Jazeera English, RT, WBAI, KPFK, Press TV Iran, The Real News Network, Govor Moskva, and Grit TV. She was a contributor to the 2014 book, Killing Trayvons, an anthology of American violence. Ms. Kimberly serves on the administrative committee of the United National Anti-Work Coalition and the advisory board of ExposedFacts.org. She is writing a book about racism and the American presidency. Good evening, Kimberly. Thank Kimberly, you. thank you. Thank you for coming. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I, I want to thank the, the Big Apple uh, Coffee Party and All Souls Church for, uh, for inviting me and for hosting uh, this event, this, uh, to have this very timely and uh, important discussion. Uh, you know, the term fake news is new, uh, those words, but there's nothing new about being lied to. Uh, there's nothing new about propaganda. Uh, we've been, I've realized as an adult, I was taught uh, fake news my whole life. Um, of everything from uh, the founding of the country to uh, Abraham Lincoln being against slavery to uh, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution to the case for WND, the case for mass incarceration. Uh, I, I have, we all have been uh, indoctrinated, and Americans don't like to think of themselves that way, but uh, we are in fact indoctr indoctrinated with, uh, uh, with lies, and uh, that is uh, a, a constant, unfortunately. Uh, it doesn't have to be with, for us as individuals, and that's why we come to events like this to talk with each other, uh, to uh, learn from uh, speakers such as our panelists, about how to uh, discern the truth. And it, uh, it does get harder and harder. Uh, that's not uh, something that any of us have imagined. We have a, a system whereby uh, the, the elites um, here in this country and around the world work hand in glove with uh, the corporate media. And the fact that the media is corporate that uh, the largest media outlets, the ones that uh, uh, give us most of the news, the fact that they are uh, parts of large conglomerates, it, that fact in and of itself tells us uh, how much danger we are in as uh, the world uh, faces so many different crises from uh, the environment to the stresses on the capitalist system. And uh, we've seen all this come into play in this last year uh, or so with, um, well, actually, before last year, and I know we'll have to, of course, talk about the, the presidential election, but ever since 2008, I think that was a watershed year, the collapse of the economy, Obama becoming president, um, the uh, surprise to, to most of us, myself included, with uh, Donald Trump emerging victorious, so this is a very pivotal time, and uh, it's very important for all of us to, to come together at this moment and determine uh, truth from fiction. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to speak very briefly with those remarks, and I'm going to turn it over to our, our speakers, and I'll introduce them uh, one at a time. Uh, yes, we do have two speakers now instead of three, but that's great. Everybody gets a little more time to talk, and we'll have a little more time to talk with one another and uh, to have Q&A uh, with all of you. So, um, as you, uh, you should have your programs, but I'll just read briefly. Uh, Ray McGovern is going to be our first speaker. A very interesting life, served as an army officer. Not that I have to say, uh, the sort of uh, bio that is not the kind of person that I usually would have uh, associated with them. Army officer, CIA, it's generally not my thing. But at any rate, 
There's hope for everyone. Served as an army officer and a CIA analyst for 30 years, specializing in uh, Russia. I guess that's what brings us together. Uh, he prepared the president's daily briefs for presidents Nixon, Ford, and Reagan, and was awarded the Intelligence Commendation Medal, which he returned in March 2006 in protest against torture. Give him up, give it up. In January 2003, uh, he co-founded the Veterans Intelligence Professionals for Sanity to warn President uh, uh, Bush and Cheney that the pre-Iraq war intelligence was fraudulent. Uh, it turned out this was hardly news to them and uh, to a complicit mainstream media that kept it from the American people. And it was no surprise to anybody paying attention either. But anyway, Ray McGovern. Can you hear me okay? Good. Thank you, Margaret, for having me here despite my checkered career. <laughs> um, I was staying last night where Dorothy Day spent her last days. And so I come here especially inspired and especially mindful of the filthy, corrupt system that is the main problem. I'd like to start off with a, uh, uh, a little quote from Martin Luther King, Jr., uh, whose uh, portrait is all over the walls of the Catholic worker down there on Third Street. It has to do with wor what we are about this evening. It has to do with the media. It has to do with exposing the truth. And that's what a lot of us are at work trying to do. He, compose he compares the problem to a boil. It's from the Birmingham, from the uh, letter from the Birmingham City Jail, and it goes like this. Like a boil that can never be cured uh, w as long as it's covered up, but must be opened with all its pus flowing ugliness to the natural medicines of air and light. So too, injustice must be exposed with all the friction its exposure creates to the light of human conscience and the air of national opinion before it can be cured. And that I see as our problem tonight. How are we going to expose all this injustice when the media has been captured? We have no fourth estate anymore. We're the best we have, and this is the hopeful thing, is we have a fifth estate, which is called the ether and the computers and the web. And what we need to do, people my age and younger, to learn how to use this better than we're doing now, and there is hope in that. Now, um, let me just recall living and growing up in the Bronx for 22 years with a family who was very religious. And what I mean by religious is they never went to bed without reading the New York Times. It was never, it was not allowed. As a matter of fact, if dad kind of dozed off after a hard work, a hard day at work, uh, uh, and didn't finish the New York Times, my brother Larry here can attest to what would happen to that New York Times. So Larry, do you remember what he'd do? Stand up and, uh, and say, you, yeah. I did not recall. Well, okay, well. <laughs> <laughs> so you can tell this was not rehearsed, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, at least in my day, Larry's a lot older than I was. Uh, but in my day, uh, that, there was a special place that my dad and mom would put the New York Times from yesterday, and no one would dare open the New York Times for today until they had finished reading the one from yesterday. That's how seriously they took it. Now, now what do you have? Well, you have a, you have a, a, a charade. Here's a... Here's the title of a very big article. I think it was in the Sunday Times, August 31, 2016. Title, How Russia Often Benefits When Julian Assange Reveals the West's Secrets. Hmm, subtitle, 
American officials say Mr. Assange and WikiLeaks probably have no direct ties to Russian intelligence services, but the agendas of WikiLeaks and the Kremlin often dovetail. Whoa. Now what does WikiLeaks trade in? Documentary evidence. They don't fool around with it. They've been criticized for not redacting it. So are we saying here that uh, because the evidence that WikiLeaks publishes is documentary and that even the CIA and the US government recognize it as true, and it dovetails with what the Kremlin is saying, well, I mean, could that be possibly like maybe because it's true? Huh? Now, I'd like to show you a, uh, a little short video. It's four minutes, and it's what happens to someone like me who says these kinds of things on CNN last time. Last time for me on CNN. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. Please. You'll see how he ends. He said, well, I guess that will be it. Number one. Yeah, number one, the first one. I know. Uh, okay. Not yet. Okay, no problem. Uh, technical difficulties, uh, you know, the CIA has all manner of intrusive capabilities. <laughs> and we worked on this very, very hard for an hour this evening. But I kid you not, seriously, okay? Now, how did WikiLeaks get the information that showed how Hillary Clinton stole the nomination from Bernie Sanders? How did they get that? What have you been told by the New York Times? They got it from a, from a Russian hack, right? Well, forget about it. It wasn't a Russian hack. It was a leak. What's a leak? You put a thumb drive in a computer. You download it. It doesn't go on the network. It doesn't go on the web. And you put it in an envelope. You send it to one of Julian, uh, Julian Assange's lieutenants, and it gets published. And this one was published two days before the Democratic National Committee. So what happened? Well, there was an emergency two days before the committee. What did the content show of these emails? That Hillary and uh, her five chief people on the Democratic National Committee, they quit on the spot. What does that tell you? Right? Debbie Wasserman Schultz and the four others. And so what did the content say? Well, it doesn't matter. They convened a little council and they said, now how are we gonna handle this? My God, you know, what's Bernie gonna do? Holy Moses, you know, he's, he's, he's kind of caved in now, but what'll he do when he finds out that there's evidence from our own emails that we stole the election from him? Oh my God, oh. Somebody says, I know who we do. We'll blame it on the Russians. And somebody says, well, but, but it was the Russians. It was, it was WikiLeaks, Julian Assange. That's okay. We'll say that Julian Assange is Work with the Russians. Oh, that, that's starting to make sense, but what would be the objective? Well, come on, of course, uh, the Russians want Trump to win. Now, that's the major premise, right? The Russians want Trump to win. I've been studying Russian leadership for more than a half a, half a century, okay? I think I know something about how the Russians look at life. And I can just see uh, Vladimir Putin sitting around the table with his associates and saying, you know, man, this Trump is really interesting. God, he's unpredictable. <laughs> he, he brags about being unpredictable and he lashes out at the, the least slight, whether it's real or, or imagined. Oh man, this is gonna be great. This is just the guy that I wanna have with his fingers on the nuclear codes. Man, this is gonna be wonderful. Let's help him win. Give me a break. You know, I, I think that uh, Putin, like everyone, uh, thought Hillary was going to win. So unless you think he's clairvoyant, why would he take the risk of hacking into the DNC computers and giving her another reason to hate him, huh? But more important, uh, why, would he, why would he kind of uh, do this to help a, an unpredictable guy win? So the whole, the whole syllogism falls apart if the major premise is that 
he looked at it like most of my German friends. I was in Germany when this happened, the election, and they said, you know, we see that it is eine Wahl zwischen Pest und Cholera. <laughs> Some of you know, it's a choice between plague and cholera, you know. <laughs> That's how I looked at it, and I'm, I dare say, I think Putin looked at it. Well, anyhow, they decided to go with this, okay, and it was masterful. Because what you saw in the New York Times in the following days, in the Washington Post and the and Wall Street Journal, is the Russians hacked. Why did they hack? The Russians hacked into the DNC computers to affect the election, okay? Big deal, okay? Jennifer Palmieri, who is the PR person for Hillary Clinton, brags about going around to the cable tents at the convention and selling the notion that the Russians wanted Trump to win and so they hacked into the DNC computers. And she com comments very openly, you know, this is a hard sell, but, but we did our best. And then when we got back to Brooklyn, then the intelligence people, the intelligence people came in and they gave us the evidence. Whoa, that's from Palmieri. I was there when she said it, okay? So what does that mean? Well, that means that John Brennan and others, head of the CIA at the time, gave her the wherewithal, the information from very classified sources, and they were able to construct this, you know, this fable that Russia hacked into the Democratic National Committee to try to help Trump win. Well, why is this important? Because right now we have a fellow named James Comey, right? And he was head of the FBI at the time. And uh, for some reason, best known to him, uh, he never got physical access to the DNC computers. He never was able to do forensics on it to see who hacked in. Did you know that? Did you watch him before the House Intelligence Committee? He's sort of squirming and he says, well, you know, yeah, I, I, I appreciate that it's really good to have direct access to, this, to, you know, to the machines and the computers, but we didn't get direct access uh, so the next best thing is we relied on the commercial outfit co called uh, CrowdStrikes, and they're, they're quite good, so we re relied on their forensics. Well, why all this, folks? Why all this? It's because the Russians, did they try to hack into the DNC? I imagine 60 foreign countries tried to hack into the DNC. Were the Russians responsible for the leak? that exposed what Hillary Clinton and the rest of them were doing? No, they weren't. So, but what about CrowdStrike's finding little bits of Cyrillic? Ooh, Cyrillic, let's, that's Russian, isn't it? Yeah, that's Russian language. They find that, and they na find the name and patronymic, Felix Edmundovich, of the first head of the KGB. Whoa, telltale signs. You know, if you're an intelligence analyst or just a reasonable person, that smells really fishy right off the bat, doesn't it? Well, now I can tell you, I can tell you, this is off the record. I don't want to, this, to leave this room, okay? <laughs> but you know who hacked in to the DNC? John Brennan and the CIA. How many know that already? Whoa, you don't read my website. You don't read Consortium News. Come on, you guys, if you don't, oh, all right, yeah, there are people from my Veterans for Peace folks over there that know that, all right? Now, how do I know that? Well, folks, I'm sorry to tell you, but you won't find out from the New York Times. You know why they hate WikiLeaks? Well, they hate them for lots of reasons. But WikiLeaks got access to what they call Vault 7, which is a treasure trove of original CIA documents. So. The third release came on August 31st. I got a call from CNN, no, from uh, CBS, no, from RT. Would you come in and uh, talk about this incredible thing? Uh, what incredible thing? Well, it just happened overnight, but we want to be first off the mark. Uh, well, tell me about it. Oh, we'll send you a link. They send me a link, and I download it, and it's printed out, and then I'm in the car, and I'm... <laughs> To get there in time, I have to go in the carpool lane there into Washington. But, you know, I'm reading this thing, and then I, I had the presence of mind to call Bill Binney. Now, how many know who Bill Binney is? Ah, good. He was the technical director of NSA, right? So I says, Bill, this looks like a big deal. Uh, they're, they're, de 
the CIA has developed this capability to hack into a computer network or server and in the CIA's words, obfuscate, obfuscate who cacked in and leave telltale signs like, well, they work in five languages, Chinese, Persian, Arabic, Korean, and Russian. Wow. Now I said, Bill, this sounds, sounds pretty important. Tell me how to think about this. This is the, the beauty of having a community of, of former intelligence officers who you can depend on to tell you the truth, okay? So Bill says, look, Ray, this is what, what this is about. NSA and CIA worked for 15 years on this program. I know about it. I was there when it started. It's an incredibly sophisticated program. It involves 700 million lines of code. 700 million. <laughs> so McGovern says, sounds like a lot, Bill. <laughs> but what does that mean? He says, well, put, I'll put it this way. Each line of code costs $25, Ray. Do the math, will you? Do the math. Okay, so here we have a program, 15 years in the making, CIA implements it because they do the dirty work, but NSA pretty much streamed it up. It costs this much. CrowdStrike's gonna find out about that program? No way are they gonna find out. They don't have the capability. So who hacked into, into the Democratic National Committee computers? It was this incredible program that NSA and the CIA worked out together, okay? implemented, it was used once in 2016, we know from the CIA documents. Look, this is not, this is not make, make believe news. This is CIA documents recognized as such. Okay, now I need to stop, but I'm gonna add one more thing. Uh, does this explain perhaps why James Comey was reluctant to send his technical experts in to look at the computers of the DNC? Visualize it. Okay, here's Comey, who is part of this deep state. Comey, John Brennan from the CIA, and you know, assortment of those uniformed admirals and generals at NSA that just do what they're told, okay? So what we have here is a, a situation where Comey is in on this act. The last thing he's gonna do is send his specialists to get physical access to the computers of the DNC because they might come back and say, Director Comey, you won't believe what we found. Yeah, this is a sophisticated program. Man, uh, CrowdStrike couldn't have figured this out. We can't figure it out. Uh, should, would you like us to enlist the help of NSA? <laughs> Comey would have to, no, 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 thanks just the same. No, 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 don't go to NSA. So that's how corrupt this thing is. That's how melded the CIA FBI and the NSA are. Those are the three major organs of this deep state. And, uh, you know, the last word I'd say is that people recognize this. I don't have a very hard regard for your Senator Chuck Schumer, but I'm going to quote him anyway on Rachel Maddow. On the 3rd of January, he permitted himself to say, no, Rachel, I used to think that, uh, uh, I used to think that uh, the President Trump was a pretty, pretty clever, pretty, the CIA again, pretty clever guy, okay? But he's done a very foolish thing. And Rachel said, oh, what's that? He's taken on the intelligence people. And they have six ways from Sunday to get back at you. So I thought he was a pretty smart businessman. He'd pick his quarrels, right? But. He's done a very foolish thing. So, Rachel Maddow, you know, facing into this, uh, this glorious opportunity to, to say, Senator Schumer, are you saying that, that the President of the United States should be afraid of the CIA? I mean, if you were interviewing Schumer, isn't that what you would say, right? But Rachel says, oh, we go to break. We go to break now, and we go to break now, so. So, you know, Schumer said it. That's, that's how the Congress looks at it. These oversight committees, they really overlook committees. You know, they p pretend to, to oversight, okay? And you got even some of the judiciary uh, collaborating in this. So we're in a pretty parlous state of affairs, folks, and to the degree we can get this knowledge up and out, uh, all I can say is you can't depend on the New York Times anymore. 
but you can depend on websites where you can get the real information. I highly recommend consortiumnews.com, which is the best website run by investigative journalist Bob Perry. I am privileged to write for it, as many, many other people write for it as well. And I have my own website, which my son, who runs it, always asks me whether I mention it. And I want to be able to say yes this time. I usually forget. It's raymcgovern.com. Really hard to, to remember, raymcgovern.com. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ray. I think I, I grew up in that same religion that you, you did in your family with the New York Times, except I was still following it as an adult. I, I'm a little embarrassed to admit now. But at any rate, um, so thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, our, our next speaker is uh, Mark Crispin Miller, who is a professor of media studies at uh, New York University and author of the book, Fooled Again, The Real Cause the real case, I'm sorry, for electoral reform. He's known for his writing on American media and for his activism on behalf of democratic media reform. His books include Boxed In, The Culture of TV, Seeing Through Movies, and The Bush Dyslexicon, Observations on a National Disorder. Uh, Mr. Crispin Miller graduated from Northwestern University with a BA in 1971, Johns Hopkins with an MA in 1973, and a PhD in 1977. Mark Crispin Miller. Well, thank you, Margaret, and uh, thank you, Ray, for preceding me, um, and thank you all for coming, despite the fact that our headliner didn't show up, right? I mean, as a TV show, because he was worried about security. Uh, I'm worried about security, too, uh, but I showed up anyway. Um, your story about Rachel Maddow, Ray, um, brought a few things to mind for me. Why didn't she say... Uh, why didn't she ask the question, are you saying that the president should be afraid of the CIA? Um, well, it would be miraculous if she had asked that question, <laughs> because that whole subject is, is taboo uh, for something of the same reason that um, it's been a very relevant question for well over 50 years. Uh, now, let me preface what I'm about to say by quoting someone I don't often quote publicly or privately, that's Adolf Hitler, okay, who um, in one very memorable passage in Mein Kampf uh, writes, the receptivity of the masses is great, their intelligence is small, but their power of forgetting is enormous, okay? Um, you know, I wish I could say uh, something that I often believed growing up which is that that's a problem in places like Germany under Hitler or the Soviet Union or North Korea. But it's really a universal problem. It's a problem everywhere. Uh, and it's all the greater of a problem in places where the, the press and, of course, the schools as well um, don't really trade in the truth, okay? Um, we are all afflicted with a certain amount of social and historical amnesia. And I think the press is sort of in the business of, of, of uh, affirming that amnesia. The people who are most afflicted with that, that amnesia rise the highest in, in the press uh, uh, world. So it's unlikely that Rachel Maddow would, would remember or allow herself to remember or to know <laughs> that John Kennedy had said that he wanted to break the CIA into a thousand pieces and scatter it to the winds. He said this out of understandable pique that he had been lied to by Alan Dulles and the rest of them about the Bay of Pigs. And he was well aware throughout his all too brief presidency that he had lost control of the government and was trying to reclaim it from the CIA, the Joint Chiefs and others. Uh, you could very well say that the dramatic climax of his presidency made pretty clear that, yeah, the answer to that question is yes, the president has something to fear from the CIA. That's what happened in Dealey Plaza. 
And there are some few very excellent books about Watergate that also make a pretty strong case that that was, that was actually a coup because for very different reasons, Richard Nixon didn't like the CIA. Now, he had terrible problems, there's no doubt about it. He was obviously nuts, that's all true. But Watergate was not the heroic story of two intrepid reporters backed by this great liberal paper who fought this thuggish cabal in the White House. You know, I mean, you've all seen all the president's men, you know. Um, it, it wasn't like that at all. And I mean, you know, at some other point tonight, if anyone wants to know, I can list some of the books people may want to read about this, but the fact is that also was a coup, a bloodless coup. And, um, you know, one, one that, that also basically uh, put an end to uh, a president who, in, in his own way, had a problem with the CIA. Uh, a president who, believe it or not, was suspected of pro-Soviet leanings by the Joint Chiefs of Staff who had him under surveillance well before Watergate. Now, I mentioned a few of these things that may have brought to a few minds in the room the phrase conspiracy theory, okay? Conspiracy theory. And I want to say something about that because it's directly relevant to the notion of fake news. Fake news is actually conspiracy theory 2.0, okay? Fake news. Fake news is a smear. It's a meme. It's a weaponized meme that's used uh, basically to discredit inconvenient information. That's what fake news is. But let's go back to conspiracy theory, okay? Conspiracy theory, I, 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 have a, a, I had a personal reason for wanting to know more about the history of that phrase. And the reason was that I had a book come out, you were kind enough to mention it, uh, Fooled Again, came out in 2005, about the theft of the 2004 election. And, uh, you know, I worked on this book uh, with great excitement and the highest hopes that it would kickstart an important national discussion of the fact that we actually have the worst voting system in the developed world. I mean, this according to Harvard and the University of Sydney, they do an annual um, survey of election systems globally, and in their last, uh, the last edition of their study, which was last February, they, they ranked the USA 26th out of 26. We have the worst voting system in the developed world, something Jimmy Carter said on NPR in 2006. Elections in this country are so corrupt that they don't even rise to the minimal level where the Carter Center would monitor them. <laughs> That's how bad they are. And yet, interestingly enough, let me add, parenthetically, the Carter Center came out uh, as part of the chorus decrying Russia's interference in our elections. It was just kind of a shock. At any rate, my book came out, I'd worked hard on it, it was full of entirely accurate endnotes, and, uh, you know, as they say, crickets. Crickets. Nothing. Uh, two newspaper reviews from coast to coast, one was, one was a pan. Uh, no interviews uh, on NPR, on which I had been a frequent guest, you know, talking about things like Madonna and, you know, pop culture. Uh, important stuff, you know, not the survival of American democracy. Uh, a friend of mine uh, offered to put up some money so we could run uh, ads on WHYY-FM, that's Philadelphia's, you know, national public radio affiliate. He lives in Philly, he said, you know, I like your book, I'll, I'll contribute some money, let's write some spots. He called them, he said, we, do you take ads for books? They said, sure. So we wrote these little spots, we sent them over, <laughs> more, more crickets, he didn't hear back. Uh, he called and, and asked, well, what, what, what happened? And they said, well, we're not going to run those spots. And he said, well, why, why not? We agreed that you would. He said, well, we don't, we don't do political advertising. So he said, well, Mark Crisp and Miller is not running for president, political advertising. This is a book that he wrote about an election, and, and the answer he got was, well, we're not just going to advertise any book. I mean, we wouldn't advertise Mein Kampf. Okay, that's, that's, and stand-up comics refer to that as a callback 
because I already brought up Mein Kampf tonight, okay. <laughs> Not that this is very funny. A at any rate, I'm, I'm going to run out of time because I have so much to say. My heart is full. But let me uh, quickly say that I was struck by the fact that, you know, the corporate media, it was a blackout. The left press attacked me. Okay, Mother Jones, The Nation, Salon, they attacked me. And they called me a conspiracy theorist. And they referred to the book as conspiracy theory. And this is the same way they treated Bobby Kennedy Jr. and, you know, Steve Freeman and others who'd written on the subject as conspiracy theories, conspiracy theory. Okay, so I, I decided I wanted to know where this phrase had come from. What's the history of this phrase? And having studied uh, the archives of the Times, the Washington Post, and Time Magazine, I discovered that conspiracy theory was not much used by journalists for the decades prior to 1967, when suddenly it's used all the time, and increasingly ever since. And the reason for this is that the CIA at that time sent a memo to its station chiefs worldwide, uh, urging them to use their propaganda assets and friends in the media to discredit the work of Mark Lane, Edward J. Ever these are books attacking the Warren Commission report. See, these books were coming out. Mark Lane's was a bestseller. So the CIA's response was to send out this memo urging a counterattack so that hacks responsive to the agency would write reviews attacking these authors as conspiracy theorists and using one or more of five specific arguments listed in the memo. Five more minutes, thank you. Uh, for example, you know, if there were a conspiracy, somebody would have talked by now. You've, you've heard this a million times, okay. So over the years since then, the phrase has been used more and more and more about a longer and longer list of subjects, you know, Jack Kennedy's assassination, Bobby's assassination, Martin Luther King's assassination, 9-11, certainly, election theft, you know, these, this is all conspiracy theory. Any discussion of false flag terror, right? That's conspiracy theory. The CIA would never do a thing like that. It doesn't happen. It's crazy. It's nuts. It's irresponsible. It's dangerous. Okay? Fake news is the horrible offspring of conspiracy theory. Okay? And, and it has come to dominate uh, uh, many minds because of the rise of Donald Trump, okay? Whose function has been, I mean, he has several functions. One of them has been to, uh, I call him the deodorant in chief because he, he sanctifies the entire rest of the system. Do you know what I mean? So all these people now think, <laughs> you like that, right? <laughs> I like it too. People now think two things. They think the CIA and the FBI are on our side. <laughs> they believe in democracy. Thank God they're there, okay? <laughs> to protect us from Russia. This is liberals now. This is liberals saying this, okay? And his other function has been to make people think that the New York Times and CNN and MSNBC and NPR, blah, 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 and blah, 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 tell the truth. And they have taken ferocious advantage of this delusion by constantly reminding us how dear to us they are because they tell us the truth, unlike Trump, who's always lying, okay? Trump, yeah, he lies all the time. I mean, he, 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 his lips are moving, he's probably lying. But the lies that Trump tells are mostly trivial lies, mm -hmm. stupid little lies, like there was a terrorist attack in Sweden when there wasn't one. Or he had, you know, 70 million people at his inauguration when he obviously didn't, you know? <laughs> I mean, I could go on. You all know these outrageous lies. I have people all over Facebook are screaming and yelling and flipping out about these horrible lies, and the New York Times can't get over it. He claimed that Obama tapped his phone. Oh my God, he has no proof. How could he say, where's his evidence for this? Like all the evidence they've adduced for Russiagate, you know, all that evidence, right? These are trivial lies, and not only that, the fact that he does lie is screamingly obvious. That is not dangerous. That is not 1984, 
people are telling us 1984, it's about Trump. That's absurd. That's, that's something people say who haven't read the book. Because far more dangerous than any of his flagrant and trivial, idiotic lies are the whoppers that have been successfully put across by the corporate press and the left liberal press in many cases, such as Putin invaded Ukraine, mm -hmm. right? Such as there are moderate rebels in Syria's civil war and we are protecting the Syrian people from this dictator who's massacring all of them, right? Those are dangerous lies. Russia hacked the election is a dangerous lie because it is war propaganda. That's what it is. It is war propaganda. Now, I have to say, having studied the media for decades, and of course having grown up in this country and having absorbed, like all the rest of us, you know, what the media pumps out since I was a child, I have to say I have never seen a moment like the present. <coughs> I have never seen a time where the delusion is so total where the lies are so dangerous and where contradicting them is so intensely reviled. And, and on, this is all the doing of liberals. That's what's, that's what's unusual about this. That's what makes this unlike the first uh, Red Scare, uh, not, not the very first Red Scare, but the one after World War II, when it was mostly, you know, troglodyte right-wingers and demented birchers and so on. Now it's, it's Democrats and some progressives. Um, and it's not just the corporate press, as I say, it's the left liberal press as well. And it's not just the left liberal press and the corporate press, but it's our premier comedians. It's Stephen Colbert. It's Bill Maher. It's people like Saturday Night Live, you know, which is, if that's not a propaganda instrument for the, for the deep state, whatever you want to call it, I don't know what one is, you know, because they've done bits uh, you know, frequent bits vilifying uh, Putin and Russians generally. They've done uh, parodies of Dilma Rousseff. It, 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 it is nonstop State Department propaganda coming from our most important weekly comedy review show. Find stuff like this on House of Cards where Pussy Riot play themselves. There's a kind of, uh, um, you know, an evil Putin character who fits directly in with the New York Times version and so on. And the propaganda juggernaut even includes Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, okay? So what we're talking about is, is an enormously successful, inescapable propaganda machine that, that must have Dr. Goebbels uh, grinning ear to ear in his birth in hell because it, it has actually managed to determine the furnishings of countless minds of our fellow citizens, I fear to disastrous effect. As Ray says, the only real salvation that we have is online. It's in those websites that have somehow managed to maintain a certain amount of journalistic integrity, and it's in the young people who now have a tremendous amount of facility with the internet and have discovered that you can find the other side of the story in seconds. I take great hope from that and, and I hope that you can share that hope with me. Thank you. Thank you. We're I'll move it a little closer. Yes. So um, uh, thank you both. Uh, you both touched on some, some very important uh, points here, and we're now going to have a, a conversation. Um, and I, I think it's important to talk about this term, fake news. I don't know who, who else recalls after Election Day, and Obama went to Germany. And um, he was appearing with Angela Merkel. And I'm sure he was, first of all, shocked that uh, Trump had won. I'm sure it was to have been a fly on the wall in, on, during those days. But at any rate, he, he mentioned fake news several times and Angela Merkel kind of was looking at him like, what are you talking about? And I think <laughs> the reason they go on and on about fake news is that they know we can get information for ourselves. 
and, be, and that's very dangerous. And that's why there's bulk collection of data, why they have, uh, keep records of all our phone calls, all our emails, uh, so that uh, uh, when uh, some moment is reached, they, they know uh, who to look for. And I guess that's a conspiracy theory. But at any rate, uh, so this is where we are with, uh, with this term fake news, which is used to, to shut us up, in, in short. But um, uh, I, you, you said, uh, you touched on, I'll, I'll start with you, Mark. You touched on uh, something about uh, uh, Trump's lies. You said that they're obvious and they're about trivial things. And one of the things that strikes me uh, since Trump won, it's very clear that presentation is everything. So Obama could get away with the most horrible lies telling people that uh, Gaddafi was going to kill his own people, or I think it was Human Rights Watch who helped with that, saying uh, Gaddafi had given his troops Viagra and they were gonna go around raping women so that we wouldn't say anything um, about this war crime committed against that country. Um, the, you know, America is indispensable, which means everybody else is dispensable. Uh, the numerous lies about very serious, very serious matters um, lies about uh, uh, Russia. It's, um, it's astounding. It's astounding to me how if you're smooth, you can get away with anything. I mean, I guess I always knew that, but there's, I, I really see that now with Trump because of who Trump is, because the kind of person he is, the buffoonery, the lack of knowledge, the, you know, no, no need to go on and on describing him. But it's easy to dismiss him because of his presentation. And that, to me, is very, very frightening. Uh, and instead of being disregarded, the things that you mentioned, those are the things that are taken most seriously. So anyway, I just wanted to start off with that. I don't know if you had any, if you wanted to expound yeah. on it or if you I, wanted I to would, add. If you mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a very important point. Um, style, mm -hmm. personality uh, count for a tremendous amount, obviously. And Obama's very smooth, mm -hmm. uh, very deft, very uh, likable. And so, um, all too predictably, millions of uh, people who should know better mm -hmm. have been perfectly willing to look past the things he's done, even when they've been demonstrably more heinous than things that Bush Cheney did mm -hmm. in many instances. Whereas, uh, suddenly they're horrible when, when Trump does them. Right, so uh, all those dead uh, civilians um, in, in Yemen mm -hmm. as a result of a botched uh, attack by our military under Trump, that's front page news, right? But the vast expansion of the drone program under Obama and, and, the, and the countless uh, civilians uh, who uh, were killed in those attacks, they couldn't, as the expression has it, they couldn't get arrested. <laughs> they could get bombed, but they couldn't, you know, no coverage. For, for that at all. Trump um, has always struck me as being like the bad guy in a professional wrestling match. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Or like, yes. you know, Tony Clifton, the thing that Andy Kaufman did, the kind of horrible, you know, nightclub singer was abusive and ugly. And that's what I always thought that's what Trump is, you know, that Trump is, he's over the top, you know, mm -hmm. he's so horrible. And I, I said throughout the campaign, and I'm not going to apologize for this, as everybody's bending over backwards to apologize uh, for, for, for making the same statement. I said throughout the campaign, this guy does not want to win. This guy is saying all these outrageous things. He's trying to get the biggest possible rise out of people. He's offending huge constituency after huge constituency. He obviously doesn't want to be president. He wants to start a TV network like Fox, you know, Fox 2.0, where he can be outrageous on camera. That's why Trump went to bed early on election night. He, and he you know, it wasn't only Obama who was surprised, it was Trump, Trump had no, ex he had no expectation he was gonna win. And you know what? Can I just get into a little more conspiracy theory? He, he didn't win, okay? Those of us who try to keep our eye on the ball and look at the evidence in elections, as opposed to thinking what we want to think, have pretty much determined that, that Trump Pence didn't win in the swing states, where there was rampant vote suppression, 
And there's copious evidence of the same computerized election fraud that Bush Cheney used to win their two elections. And let me add, that was used to give Hillary Clinton the nomination for her party. There's no question about it, right? I mean, this uh, democracy lost from Election Justice USA. Look at it's online. It's over 100 pages, chapter and verse. That was stolen. There were 11 primaries. I mean, I could go into it and, and you know, I think persuade even the most skeptical that that's true. But the fact is Trump didn't win, so um, the media didn't get it wrong. Uh, Hillary didn't lose because she's grotesquely out of touch with the American people, though she is grotesquely out of touch <laughs> with the American people. She didn't lose because she's a warmongering Wall Street shill, which she is. I'm not gonna argue with that. She is that, but the fact is, I think the evidence is pretty clear that enough people voted against him that she should have won, mm -hmm. okay? Whatever we may think of her, see? Now, what we have here is this back and forth. You've, you've suggested this to me. You've got this back and forth where you've got a really kind of lethal corporate Democrat mm -hmm. who is a creature of the intelligence community and lets the military do whatever they want, among other failings. But he's cool. You know, he's our first black president. He's a cool guy. He's a Democrat. He says progressive things. He pays lip service to this stuff like gay marriage, okay? Then you got Trump, Trump, you know, who's just this creature. <laughs> He's grotesque with the comb over and the little hands. You've all heard it. He's a thug. He's a goon. He's, he's embarrassing. He's ignorant. All this stuff is true. Everybody's going mad about how much they hate him. When he's gone, they're going to miss him. That's how much people enjoy hating Trump, right? <laughs> but just as with you know, he's the deodorant in chief, he makes the CIA and FBI look good, he makes the press look honest, he also makes his Democratic counterparts look, oh, thank God they've saved us. Do you know what I'm saying? If and when we get back to business as usual, whenever that is, if it proves to be continually impossible actually to elect a real progressive, although a real progressive could win in a cakewalk in this country, it could happen if we actually did reform the voting system to the point that somebody like that could win, the will of the electorate could be honored, okay? That would be one thing. But if we're gonna go back to this fake battle between two parties that are in collusion on issue after issue, then I'm afraid that this theatrical stuff that we're talking about is gonna be kind of the reason why. Did you wanna add anything to that, Ray? Yeah, I would just say that uh when I was reading the latest poll from AP about how many Americans are convinced that uh, the Trump campaign had a very illicit, suspicious, and really bad contacts with Russia, the, uh, the proportion was 68% believed that in one way or another, and 49 of that 68% believed it really strongly, okay? That reminded me of right before the war in Iraq, when 69% of the people in the United States were convinced that Saddam Hussein not only had weapons of mass destruction, not only was uh, a partner of, of uh, Osama bin Laden, but that Saddam Hussein had something to do with 9-11. 69% folks, 68% now. That's really dangerous. And if I were Vladimir Putin, I'd be watching this very, very closely because the more that our liberal folks, and you didn't mention Amy Goodman, oh. but she's, uh, you know, she, she deserves uh, to be put in that camp, uh, which I say to my great distress because, you know, I have great admiration for what Amy does domestically. I mean, Standing Rock and all that stuff. I mean, she's terrific. I've learned more American history from Amy Goodman than I have in my history books. But on, on foreign policy, she's drunk the Kool-Aid. And there's nothing at all that I can do or say or that others can do or say would break through that thing. As recently as, what, yesterday with Oliver Stone. She's, you know, 
insinuating a little thing here about uh, the hacking and for the Russian hacking. So what I'm saying here is that this is really dangerous and uh, I, I think we're, we're called to be more, more aware now since we went through Iraq in March of 2003, we're in that preparatory period where uh, Mad Dog Mattis would be just, just as happy as a lark uh, to launch whatever Trump told him to do. And uh, we know uh, actually, we don't probably know, but Cy Hirsch, anybody know who Cy Hirsch is? Okay. You, you remember he used to work for the New York Times, he used to write stories about uh, what the CIA was doing in the 50s and 60s, and he wrote about Milai, and he wrote about Abu Ghraib, and he, he's the best, the unparalleled investigative reporter. Now. He used to publish in the New Yorker. Has anybody seen any any articles by Cy Hirsch in the New Yorker? How long has it been? Three, four years. Uh, does he does he try in other publications? Yeah, he does. He can't actually publish any publication in this country. He's got to go to the London Review of Books. Now, let me tell you another story related. He has an incredibly good article coming out within the next three days. It has to do with what really happened with those chemical, the chemical event, let's call it, in Idli province of, of Syria, okay? It was not, as we knew from our contacts, it was not a chemical weapon or bomb dropped from a Syrian plane, okay? It wasn't that at all. Something very, very different. It was a warehouse in rebel territory containing all kinds of precursor chemicals. And it was thought to be an ammo dump. They bombed it and all of a sudden, no secondary explosions, just you know, this gas come over. That poor village and all those people were killed. So that's a far cry from what our president claimed. Now Cy Hirsch has written that up. And he's been struggling for the last two months, two months to get it published. And he thought he had it ready for the, no well, he thought that the London Review of Books was gonna publish it just as they have his last three, okay? Finally, they said, no, we're not gonna do it. But it's coming out anyway. Watch for it this week. It'll be out in English translation. It's gonna appear first abroad. So what I'm saying here is that's how bad it is. I mean, not even recognized experts, you know, real, real uh, journalists are able to, to tell the story in the press here. They get shunned. Um, they're all, you know, one, little, one other little thing, Colleen Rowley, who knows who Colleen Rowley is? She was the incredible uh, FBI special agent general counsel, or not general counsel, but counsel for the Minneapolis division, okay? She blew the whistle on all the mistakes that the FBI had made before 9-11. They were horrendous mistakes. One actually wonders whether they were really mistakes, but the, 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 the crew in, in, in Washington just didn't pay any attention to all, all these little um, things that needed to be connected. Well, she wrote an incredible memo while she had you know, two years left before retirement. That's guts, folks, that's guts. To Mueller, Director Mueller, who is now the press special counsel for James Comey. And they published that, New York Times did. The New York Times published another memo she wrote right before the attack on Iraq saying, look, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you're doing because not only is it gonna be unsuccessful, but it's gonna come back and haunt us in, in this country. Because once you take, once you be, believe that you can preempt stuff, right? You can, you can use force to preempt what might happen then the organs of the police here in this country are gonna abandon their, their discipline, FBI and other special agents, they're gonna do preemptive force rather than the kind of force that they do under the law up till now. So all these things are at play here and it's, uh, it's very concerning. The last thing I'll say is this, James Comey and uh, Bob Mueller, I have to say, have a very distinguished uh, reputation in the New York Times. James Comey and Bob Mueller are thugs. They were behind the war on Iraq. 
They were behind the torture. They were behind the illegal eavesdropping on every single one of us. And somehow or other, this has never been revealed. Now, who tried to reveal it? Oh, Colleen Rowley. She wrote an op-ed for the New York Times, and for the first time in history, they turned it down. Why? Because it, it exposed what Bob Butler and James Comey not only tolerated, but fostered in, in way of un unconstitutional activity in this country. And so, here's James Comey, and he decides to leak a memo on a conversation that he had with the president, and he has it leaked, and then, by his own admission, his aim being to have a special prosecutor named? By God, that happens, and who is it? His best friend, Bob Mueller. Now, that's really great, and besides, nobody knows what's in that real memo because he gave it to whom? Anybody know? Bob Mueller. Not the Congress, not to anybody. And so, th this is the incestuous, uh, me, deep didn't, state didn't sort Senator of thing. Senator Schumer say six ways to Sunday? Yeah, six <laughs> ways to Sunday. So, so what I'm saying is, this is formidable. And you know, speeching is really nice. I like to quote Cesar Chavez. He used to say, you know, it's really nice. Thanks for that op-ed. You know, oh, your speech was really great. But without action, nothing's going to happen. Okay. And you say, oh, there aren't enough of us. But I say, there are enough of us. But without action, nothing's going to happen. And that's the, that's the, the place we're, we're at now. Martin Luther King said, there is such a thing as too late. It's getting pretty, pretty damn near to too late, folks. We've got to put our bodies into it and stop this foolishness and expose it to the degree we can, as Mark and others uh, are trying to do. I, thank you. We have just a couple minutes. I, I think it's Im, Im, important to um, point out one thing, all this talk of uh, Russia meddling in the election. Uh, as if the United States never meddled in anybody's election. <laughs> and somebody actually counted between World War II and 2000, the United States intervened, interfered with elections 80 times. This is not coups, not invasions, not wars. Election interference, eight zero times. And this has never come up as an issue. Um, you know, all this, it's, oh, it's so terrible, our democracy, as if um, it's okay for the United States to interfere in other countries' efforts to have a democracy. And speaking of Russia, in 1996, the United States, Bill Clinton, his uh, then friend, uh, what was a horrible man, Dick Morris, sent people to Moscow to interfere in Russia's election. They went on record. It was a Time Magazine cover story. I believe there was also a movie, uh, an HBO movie about it. And nobody talks about that anymore. All this talk about Russia, if, if the Russians did interfere, in our election, why is it so terrible? Can I answer that? Yeah, sure. sure. Um, how many of you watched M Megyn Kelly's interview with Putin? Okay, or watched what NBC broadcast of the interview? Because, uh, you know, they made liberal cuts in the full length version, and one of the things they cut was uh, Putin's point by point rebuttal of Megyn Kelly's brief against him as this, you know, th thug who murders his dissidents and journalists and so on. One of the things he said was that the uh, U.S. had done f much more and far worse than even he had been accused of doing. U.S. interference in elections falls under that heading. One of the things that's important to note, everybody's heard of the Church Committee report from the mid-70s, right? The Senate investigation of the CIA. Very few people have heard of the Pike Committee report, which was the House investigation at the same time. That was a hearing, uh, an investigation that was subverted and sabotaged by the CIA just as surely as they sabotaged the 9-11 Commission. And uh, the Senate then classified the report. So it's actually never been available to American readers. If you want a copy of the Pike report, you have to get it from Amazon UK, where it has an introduction by Philip Agee right, the, the, you know, renegade CIA officer, it's worth getting a copy. Reformed. Reformed, right. It's worth getting a copy 
because the Pike report, the Pike report makes the point in its second of three sections that election work is probably what the CIA had been doing most of worldwide with the possible exception of propaganda, okay? That's probably the primary reason why the Pike Report was classified and why it's still unavailable. Uh, all that we're talking about really has to do with the fact that, that the press is at the service of the state and constantly prettifying the picture. There is so much about our past, about our present, that we cannot know, we cannot even talk about without incurring uh, the boundless wrath of the press, which functions just as cruelly and, and, and mercilessly to critics of the system as, as you could say the press in the Soviet Union did. Yeah, and I... Let me just add a... a one minute. Yeah, so one minute uh, our, quote uh, to that, and that is that this, uh, when Megyn Kelly uh, said, you know, well, what about your suppressing of all dissent there in, in, this, in Russia, you know, it's this terrible way. And Putin very coolly said, well, you know, um, when we uh, deal with demonstrators, we deal with them according to the law, and our organs of state security, the police, are unarmed. Yes. Oh, unarmed. Yeah, they don't have uh, automatic weapons. They don't have any weapons. And look at even these terrible photos that you see in the New York Times about the demonstration. See if those Russian police are armed. They're not, okay? And they don't have to be armed because they don't have this damn Second Amendment abuse in, in, in Russia, okay? It's not easy to get a weapon in Russia. But my point is this. He said, you know, I remember uh, Occupy Wall Street. Do you remember Occupy Wall Street? Do you remember? Yeah, okay. Many of us were there, right? He says, what happened? The organs of state security got all around and they suppressed it together and <laughs> that was the end of Occupy Wall Street. <laughs> he goes. <laughs> yes. It was amazing. Well. And that's what happened, right? We have these clusters now, CIA, FBI, Homeland Security, you name it, NSA, DIA, they all have these clusters, what do they call them? Fusion centers. Fusion centers, yeah. Yeah, and so they, they get together and with the, the mayors of Oakland or the mayors of Baltimore, and they say, well, now, whoa, these people look, uh, you know, uh, crush them or come uh, invade them at 2 o'clock in the morning. So, uh, you know, Putin was, was typically, you know, sort of saying foie, sort of, you know, what about what you did to Wall Street? And then he goes, goes, goes <laughs> Well, what about the fact that uh, police in this country kill three people every day? Um, anyway, but we're supposed to be the ones with the better human rights. So, um, we've run over a little bit. We do have to have our Q&A now. Um, there's a microphone there, and I know, um, so please line up if you cannot uh, get to the microphone. I know one is being, going to be, uh, it's the same mic? So. Okay, so if anybody, does anybody fit that category? You have a question but can't get to the mic, raise your hand. Nobody? No, I don't. Okay, I don't. so we've run know. over. This is always, you know, the time always goes so fast, so much faster than you think. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to be strict here, be fair but strict. Um, so questions. Questions, 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 not statements, not speeches, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be strict about this. And it should take you less than 60 seconds to ask your question. All right. So, go ahead. Less than 60 seconds. Um, my name's Richard. Thank you very much for talking about the Russian non-hacking. I've, I've been fighting with people for this for about a year now, and I've <laughs> gotten so many people pissed off, but I keep doing it. Um, I guess it, probably two quick questions. I read a report recently, this is about the Russian hacking again, about you know, 33 more states have discovered they were hacked. And it seems to be, like you said, a progression of like the Iraq war where they just keep putting out more propaganda and more propaganda until they get the numbers up high enough where it seems ultimately like they wanna have a war with Russia, which is what I think is what they want. That's kind of my first question. My second question uh, is- uh, one que I, I should have also had one question. Okay, then let me ask my second question. I'll make that my question. When you talk about propaganda, 
a lot of people think, well, I'm really smart. I would know propaganda when I see it. So I just would like to get your, your um, response on that because I don't think that's true. I, you know, like so things get reported. I don't know if it's propaganda or not. So I just want to get your feedback okay. on that. Well, I can answer that quickly. Uh, we're all able. And one minute answers too. We're all able. We're all able to perceive propaganda that we don't agree with, right, and deplore it as propaganda. But we cannot. We cannot perceive the most successful propaganda, which is why it is successful. You see. So if it comes to us uh, in, in the raiment of the New York Times, which we trust and have come to know throughout our lives, the great gray lady, we, don't, we can't think that it's propaganda. If we see some screaming, uh, you know, uh, 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 Soviet poster or, or, or something squawking over Chinese loudspeakers, we can say, yeah, that's propaganda. But it is precisely in the nature of winning propaganda to come at us as something other than what it is. So people who think they're too smart for it are, uh, you know, mi misinformed. Okay. Go ahead. Do you have any? Yeah, let seconds. me just uh, address the <laughs> Russian part of that. Look, um, it's very easy, you know. Peace is very bad for, war, for, uh, for arms traders, you know, who Pope Francis had the guts to say before Congress, uh, in September of last year, um, the, bloods, the blood drenched arms traders are the problem. And so uh, there's been a real resurgence of the arms manufacturer and trade since uh, they exploited the coup that we mounted in Kiev uh, to justify more tension with Russia. Now, I, I want to say that no one in his right mind would want to get in war in a war with Russia. But you know, there are a lot of people not in their right mind. You know, Mad Dog Mattis, by definition, is not in his right mind. And so uh, I think that the, we, we can't be sort of uh, lackadaisical and say, well, you know, this will never happen. Because you push the Russians so far, you, you build anti-ballistic missile systems around their periphery and threaten them with a first strike. And they're going to be down to a hair-trigger decision as to whether to launch their nuclear arsenal. I'm going to cut you off. Okay, next. 60 seconds. Hi. Question for Ray. In what publication will Cy Hirsch's uh, article be coming out? And a question for, uh, for Mark. Um, any comments on Russian and uh, Trump co-investments, uh, if, or if you agree with that phrase? Of, um, and, and a question for Ray, what actions do you suggest uh, citizens uh, what, take? Well, Thank you. you. Asked, okay, just two. The first one's real easy to answer. I can't answer it because the last time I answered it, it was a London Review of Books for sure tomorrow. And people intervened and it didn't appear. But I can tell you, look for, th look for it in three days and you'll see it uh, appearing abroad but translated into English. I think there's already significant circumstantial evidence that Trump has been involved with Russian criminal elements. That's, you know, Trump Tower has been under surveillance for that reason. That strikes me as entirely credible. I mean, Trump's been mobbed up his whole life. Uh, you know, if our reporters would ever read any of those rectangular things full of paper, you know, what are they, uh, books, you know? I mean, there's a lot of books, literally good books written about Trump, going all the way back to, uh, you know, Wayne, uh, thank you, Barrett. David K. Johnston has a very good book out about Trump. Trump was friends with Roy Cohn. You know, he's a, he's a thug, he's a criminal. So that's credible, but you know, to, to claim that that means that the Russians stole the election is a bit of a leap. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to say, Ray, I think you do a great job, and I follow everything you say. I hope that there'll be a transcript of this and a video that uh, will be, uh, people will know where to get it. Uh, maybe you could tell us about that. Um, but uh, by the way, I just had an article published on the internet uh, the other day. Um, raise your hand if you want to go to war with Russia that uh, you might find on op-ed news. You have 35 my, seconds. My question, question is to Ray. My question is to Ray. I agree. I'm with you on everything up to the point of your being definitive that it's Brennan and the CIA who leaked the uh, emails because that kind of is counterintuitive in terms of the CIA uh, being more favorable to Clinton. So I'm wondering if you could uh, expound on that a bit. Okay. Uh, what logic would it be for them 
to want to help Trump when Clinton was their neoliberal, well, neocon. It, yeah. This wouldn't be to, to help Trump. This would be to denigrate him, to make sure that people realize he's not fit to be president. Uh, Bre Brennan started leaking, as I said. Palmieri said we started getting intelligence leaks, right? As soon as we got back to Brooklyn, yeah, after the convention. So Brennan is leaking like a sieve, okay? So much so that the Wall Street Journal complained, you know, the CIA's not talking to us, they're just talking to the New York Times, and, and then the Washington Post, it was really bizarre. So he did everything he could to discredit it, and then he asked Obama, could I talk to each and every one of the Electoral College? Now Obama, you know, not me, but my, my minions, could we brief them on all we know about this terrible Trump and his ties with the Russians before they vote? Now to Obama in his typical lawyerly, you know, compromised fashion says, well, no, well, I'll, 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 I'll repeat the stuff that the Russians did it, and the Russians did all that stuff, but no, I don't think that's gonna work, so you're not allowed to brief all these people. And of course, electoral violence vote, but they didn't stop, and they're still going. So it's a twin thing. They wanna explain how it could possibly be that Hillary, you know, Hillary lost the election. It couldn't be that she was the worst possible candidate nobody trusted, okay? And then, you, once you prove that, then you can say, well, it was the Russians, and then to those, to the degree that the blood-soaked arms traders uh, don't want any good relationship with Russia, you screw that up too. You screw it up royally, and so far, they have been able to prevail. It's a real question. If Trump continues to take on the deep state, whether he'll prevail. I mean, if I were a betting man, I would say he probably won't. Yes, next. Yes, you touched somewhat on my question and your, and your answer there. It's obvious what the Democratic motives are. Uh, they lost the election. They want to blame it on the Russians. Um, what is the motive of the deep state, as you, as you mentioned? Trump, uh, throughout his campaign, was making these heterodox noises in his erratic fashion against uh, regime change wars, in favor of better relations with the Russians. Uh, on the eve of his inauguration, he made his famous interview about all the blood the U.S. has on its hands. Astonishing remark. And his strike at Syria was obviously under serious pressure. I mean, it didn't amount to anything. He knew it wouldn't. So, I mean, how does the balance stand then between Trump and his, you know, his sort of dilettante uh, interest in, you know, better relations abroad and the uh, forces he has aroused against him? Well, they're very powerful forces that were really, really worried about whether he was serious about working out a decent relationship with Russia for the reasons that I already mentioned. Um, there are other forces at play here. Uh, it's true, you, know, you, you get John Brennan, they knew what to expect from Hillary. John Pr Brennan probably wanted to stay, stay as CIA director. Mikey, what's his name, Mikey? Yeah, Pompeo, but the, the guy who went on NPR and said we should kill as many Russians and Iranians as we can in, in Syria. Mike Morell, you know, all of them thought that she was going to win, and when it became a little, you know, they tried their best to, to screw it up. So, yeah, they put their eggs in that basket, and they were just as uh, astounded as all the rest of us that uh, Trump won, and Trump had no love lost for these guys. Look, here's the head of the, C the FBI, right? He comes to, to, the, to the president-elect. And he says, look, uh, Mr. President, we know you, we're president-elect. You're going to be president in two weeks. But this is what we got on you. This is typical. This is what we got on you. This is J. Edgar Hoover speaking. And he opens this dossier, dossier done by the British. They're great at dossiers. Remember what they did before Iraq? Okay, so this dossier has all kind of scurrilous act, uh, accusations of the president, and here's Comey saying, now, this is going around in the press, it's gonna come out, and so we wanna make sure that you see this now, because you're gonna be president. Now, if I were Trump, I would be really pissed off at that. I really would be. I'm gonna be. have to stop you. Sorry, this is like, beat the clock. Yes, sir. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, all of you. Do you think since things are, uh, as you're saying, time is short, 
What are some other ideas? Establishing a new political party, perhaps, or if that's going to take too long, if we've just got to do a lot of civil disobedience, nonviolent civil disobedience on a massive scale, how can we get it out to more than the hundred or so people who are here? What are some really drastic, but legal, constitutional, nonviolent things we can do? Well, yes. I want to say one thing really quickly. Um, you know, I wouldn't discount the importance of social media uh, and the internet generally, which reaches many more people than we may think, which is precisely why there's so much anxiety at the, at the top about fake news and so much, uh, you know, sort of uh, constant ferocious discrediting of what people find online. Uh, Facebook now has been censoring people's posts, uh, you know, a couple of friends of mine posted links to the Putin interviews with Oliver Stone and Facebook took them down. Th this kind of response indicates that this is a very uh, a potentially important and powerful uh, weapon that we have for educating people. The other uh, part of my answer is simply that we, as mundane as it sounds, we cannot ever discount the absolute urgent importance of genuine election reform Okay? We need hand-counted paper ballots. We need a ban on the participation of private companies in the election. We need every American to be automatically registered on his or her 18th birthday, and we need election day to be a national holiday. This stuff could all be done very, very simply, and it would make a tremendous difference. I mean, there's other things, there's gerrymandering, there's, there's you know, dark money, all those things have to be addressed too. But again, we have the worst voting system in the developed world. So anybody who thinks that next time we can get Tulsi Gabbard elected, or maybe we can get Bernie elected, if we just organize hard enough and give move on enough money, okay, that's, that's a delusion. That's like mental illness to think that the, the, the outcome will be different this time around. It's not gonna happen. Uh, I know it's not romantic to be talking about elections, but, but you know, if we ever want to move the system somewhere to the left, uh, we have to take that into account. Okay. Yes, sir. Just a quick one here. Uh, I notice a lot of people have gray hair out there like I do. Yeah. Okay. You have a distinct advantage which you need to put in play. What do I mean? When I got beat up pretty bad uh, just turning my back on Hillary Clinton as she was talking about the need for respect for dissent, uh, in Iran, okay? Uh, she got all kinds of emails and telephone calls. People were irate. Why? Because Americans don't like old people to get beat up, okay? Young people, ah, they gotta have a comment to them, you know, they shouldn't be the. But old people with this kind of hair, they really don't like that. So all of you who have this kind of hair, I see many of you out there, this is something you should put into play. They're not gonna kill you, at least not yet. Well. They probably won't even break your arm. But to the degree uh, you, can, you can play on the natural sympathy of Americans for what happens to old people, do it. You're more trusting than I am. Yes, sir. Go ahead. <laughs> so while the de Democrats, the Democratic Leadership Committee was raising the charge of Russia interfering in the U.S. elections, would you please tell us what former President Obama was doing with regard to the French elections? If, if you don't know what I'm, you know yes, what I'm I'll, referring I'll, to? Yes, I'll take that, actually. Okay. It's, um, yeah, he endorsed Macron. He, he, made, he, endorsed he made ads for Macron. He did ads for him. He endorsed mm. Angela Merkel. Well, it wasn't called an endorse. He appeared with her in public and gave his big speech. Mm. He is doing, until at, at the very last moment, <laughs> he's doing the business of the global elite. And that is why they made him president in the first place. Wow. So, yes, of course he endorses uh, a banker. Isn't the guy a bank? Suddenly this... Yeah. At any rate, I, I could go and I'm trying to keep it uh, uh, short myself. But, uh, yes, it is, it is um, exactly what um, uh, others have been accused of being. But he says America is exceptional and indispensable. So I think he can... Okay, thanks. So my question is, do you think irony still exists in the United States. Unfortunately not. Thank you. Next. Yes. <laughs> oh, uh, yes, hello. Um, Can somebody adjust the mic for this lady? Oh. She's, she, oh. There we go. Better. Oh, yes, I'm wondering, uh, you mentioned, uh, Mr. McGovern, about um, 
uh, faith in, in the uh, internet and so on, but what are your concerns about the ongoing uh, attacks on net neutrality that uh, the Trump administration is uh, in, uh, trying to or has with the FCC and, and what can we do about it to fight against it? And in addition, uh, many of us know about alternate uh, sources, but I would assume that the general public does not and often thinks those alternate sources as fringe, left-wing fringe. So how can we fight against that kind of, I guess, bias or propaganda uh, where people wouldn't look at uh, other What's sources than New yeah. York Times. Let's stick with I one. I would be happy to like uh, talk about uh, natu uh, net neutrality, but I know about one-tenth uh, as much as, uh, as Mark does here. And so would you like to handle that? Like well, that? you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a technical issue, but the fact is net neutrality has to be protected uh, or else, uh, you know, the, the, the most powerful corporate interests will basically determine what websites are available and what ones Sorry. aren't. It has to be protected at all costs. Under this administration, it probably won't be. Uh, it may move to the point where civil disobedience is, is necessary, I would say. And then uh, Ray can go out and get beat up. I, I, will, I, wanted to add, I wanted to add one thing. Members of the Congressional Black Caucus are among the worst when it comes to the issue of net neutrality. They are all completely bought off by the telecommunications industry. They're among the worst. I felt compelled to say it. Okay, my dear, yes. Um, I was thrilled to hear the plot line of our FBI head understanding that the CIA had made this false trail of Cyrillic in the software. Now he and his best friend are investigating the question as to whether the Russians uh, and Trump were colluding on the the election, and it sounds almost like something in, 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 in a French play, you know, a play within a play, or, or, or Italian, pic, you know, Pico Teatro Theater of the 16th century. What, what is in the minds of these two supposed uh, heroes, the FBI and his buddy? What, what, what do they want to happen? All right, my dear, that's it, answer. Well, well, part of the things at play here is what I call the HWHW virus. You've not heard about it? Yeah, HWHW is for Hillary would have won. Okay? Now, it's a very infectious virus because <laughs> lots of people suffer from it, including Amy Goodman, including people who just can't wrap their minds around the fact that she lost all by herself. Okay? And so it had to be the Russians. And, and that that is at play here, and it's really very noxious and really debilitating. Let me, let, I, I have to jump in. I mean, because I, I want to say again, that the evidence does suggest that Hillary actually did, did win. And that raises a fascinating question. If that's true, you know, if, if the Republicans actually shut down Jill Stein's recounts, which they did, yes, they did. because they didn't want anybody to know what they were going to discover, why didn't uh, Team Hillary and the Democrats make a big issue of the election theft? And that's because that subject, election theft, is absolutely taboo in this country, and it has been since the 70s, okay? You cannot talk about it, even when you've been ripped off yourself, okay? So, uh, you know, I think she might have won, uh, you know, maybe earned m enough more votes if Comey hadn't done what he'd done mm -hmm. to make a theft difficult, but I think the decision was made at a much higher level than we're used to discussing, that um, I think that by the time election day rolled around, she had too many liabilities, maybe her illness, possibly, maybe Pizzagate, who knows what it was, but I think that there was a decision to go with plan B. That's a speculation, but I, I, I think it makes next. sense. Yes, next. Until about two hours ago, I thought that the Megyn Kelly interview with Putin, I thought he was disarmingly cool and hiding all sorts of horrible things and that Comey's uh, presentation was heartfelt and patriotic. So my question is, really? what does the deep state want? What is their end goal? You know what, um, okay, so answer this. No, no, go ahead. One of you answer, I'm sorry, I interrupted myself. Just well, one, they, one of you respond. I, I think Ray would agree with me when I say that they want endless war Right. serial war, and they want to maintain the American empire, 
because the indispensable nation does actually have a global empire, and they do not want any democratic interference at all, right? And I'm not going to let you answer. Come. Uh, polls say that trust in news media is at like the lowest point ever. Um, Closer to the mic. Polls say that news media is trusted less than ever, um, and I, there's a real danger of people becoming, you know, despite the anger that exists, people becoming disillusioned and not knowing who to trust and not trusting anybody and disconnecting. Um, so can you recommend strategies that people can use for identifying sources of truth telling in journalism that aren't subverted to the narratives of the military industrial complex and um, the deep state and global elites? Read blackagendareport.com. Okay, one of you. Sorry. He's my moderator. Well, yeah, read Black Agenda Report. Read Consortium News, as Ray said. Read Counterpunch. I mean, I mean there, are you know, there are also good articles even in the most rancid corporate outlets, you know. You can't just sweepingly rule out any possible organ. You've, you've got to learn how to, and this is your question, what are strategies for doing this? I mean, all you can do is cast a, a net wide, uh, keep an open mind, and, and, and be sure to check the information that you receive, because there is a lot of crap on the internet. There is a lot of disinformation out there, it's true. Uh, so, you, you know, but you can't just assume that because an outlet has a certain title, or it's called RT, for example, that you can't trust it, you know. Um, it, it, it's difficult because we haven't mentioned this yet tonight, but it is, the press is not the only problem. The academy is just as big a problem. Absolutely. The schools are just as big a problem. Amen. From uh, you know, elementary school all the way up through graduate school, it's a serious problem. So we, we have to somehow rediscover something like the working people's universities and colleges of the old left, where people you know, learned how to teach themselves and be taught by real experts sort of unofficially, which is the best I can do to answer. And I'm not going to let you answer. One. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I think one of the problems tonight has been the confusion between intentional misinforming and just lousy journalism. <laughs> I'm a reader of the Times, and uh, there are some things I believe and some things I don't believe that are written there. But how this whole idea, for example, of Iran, whose government was overthrown by the CIA and the British intelligence organizations back when Mohammed Mazadeh was the prime minister, over a, over a um, dispute about the, uh, the oil there, um, and then has turned Iran into an enemy of the United States is a story that has been told all over the place and yet is never discussed in the times when they bring up the issue of the differences between Iran and the United States. This is a situation where the okay, United sir. States actually went in and overthrew sir, a sir. legitimate government. Sir, okay. Next. So that you have a question about it? Yes, the question is, how do we correct the bad journalism? Thank I th you. I don't, in other words, I'm not saying it's all bad faith. Sir. And it's all intentional. Person, what I'm going to do is we have a question about correcting bad journalism. You give the example of Iran, the gentleman behind you. And you're going to ask your qu very quick question. Yes, I'll be very and this quick. lady should, no, I don't know why anybody's trying to get online. We're, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I should have been like the person in the, grocery store. This is the last person. I, I don't, I'm sorry. I don't think we can answer your question. All right, sir. Answer your question very quickly. Okay, Iran, I, bad journalism. And you, sir? I think I've heard that the, the deep state was behind um, Hillary Clinton and then that the election was stolen by for Donald Trump. I'm sort of like you to reconcile those two things. Okay. Thank you. And the last person. Any comment about chemtrails? Chemtrails, okay. Chemtrails, that's a big thing. All right, so Iran. So a uh, gentleman asked a question about bad journalism and used the case of Iran. One of you can answer. Well, um, it, 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 there is a difference between bad journalism and disinformation. Um, you know, when you go to work for any outlet like the Times or the Washington Post or CBS, whatever it is, you develop an instinct 
uh, for knowing what kind of stories are going to fly and what kind of stories aren't going to fly. If, if you want to be uh, successful in that profession, you learn to follow the appropriate script. Cy Hirsch didn't follow it at the New York Times. Chris Hedges didn't follow it at the New York Times. Raymond Bonner didn't follow it at the New York Times. Sidney Shanberg didn't follow it at the New York Times. So there have been very good journalists at these places and they get squeezed out. This has happened more and more over time. Uh, you know, a useful thing to read about all this is Carl Bernstein's classic uh, Rolling Stone article, The CIA and the Media, which is in many ways misleading, but fundamentally enlightening, because he reported then that over 400 American journalists had been on the CIA payroll. That hasn't stopped, okay? No. And that's not the only way that they exert their influence. So it isn't, it isn't bad journalism. I mean, it is bad journalism, but there's a tremendous number of subjects on which they consistently report untruths, and it isn't only in foreign policy. Uh, they will not report things like chemtrails. I'm gonna, you know, take one of those other questions. They will not report Fukushima and the outflow of toxic waste from that place. They completely ignore it and have for years. They will not honestly report on vaccines. They have reported plain lies about that. They will not report the truth about the dangers of Wi-Fi and cell phone radiation. The climate, I mean, listen, they won't report on the inordinate effect of industrial agriculture and meat eating on, on the climate. I mean, this stuff is all ruled out. That is not just bad journalism. That almost amounts to a crime against humanity because you're not telling people things that they need to know uh, for their own protection and their own welfare, just as surely as what they don't report about Syria and Russia puts us all at risk. And that was indeed a crime at Nuremberg, was it not? Yes. Lying through the media. Okay, deep, deep state for Clinton. And I'm sorry I didn't take my notes very well. He wanted us to reconcile the, the deep state being okay. behind Hillary and then Trump uh, winning. Okay. So I thought I dealt with that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You did. Okay. Well, I'll just say very quickly again, one possible explanation is that they did intend Hillary to be president so that our first female president could pick up where, where our first black president left off and look all progressive and do heinous things. But I believe that they may have decided to go to plan B because by election day, Hillary was so caked with excrement, uh, excuse me, you know, she, she had so many problems. Possibly her health, you know, was as bad as people have said. So. Pizzagate, maybe they didn't want that simmering uh, out there on the internet for four years like Whitewater did when Bill was president. It's possible that they just made an adjustment and decided to back the other horse. Okay. Just a guess. Now, chemtrails, I know absolutely nothing about chemtrails, so can either of you address? Yeah, I'm going to seize the opportunity to, uh, to say something about chemtrails. I don't know anything about chemtrails, but I want to say something else here. <laughs> um, the epitome of how the leadership of the corporate media acts is they know what's best for the American people. They really believe that. And I have a story here that points that up. My boss, Bob Perry, who is the editor of Consortium News, after he revealed Iran-Contra, became a real star, went down to work for Newsweek, all of a sudden there was a big soiree. Bob was one of the, the leading lights, and so he invited to 12 people here, soiree at the head of Newsweek's chateau. Uh, there were some folks there, like a young representative from Wyoming, his name was Richard Cheney, and... Uh, uh, Brent Scowcroft, who had just stepped down from being the National Security Advisor. Well, Bob is sitting there having his uh, uh, shrimp cocktail, and uh, Scowcroft says, you know, uh, I know that uh, Admiral Poindexter has uh, got to you know, talk to the, uh, to the Congress uh, on Tuesday, but I would tell him that we never told Ronald Reagan anything about Iran-Contra. Now, this is Bob's first experience with this distinguished group that knows best, so... He drops his fork, it clangs on the shrimp cocktail, and he says without thinking, General Scowcroft, are you suggesting that your successor lie to Congress? Did he perjure himself? Yeah, that's how, that's how quiet. Bob says it seemed like two minutes. It was probably 30 seconds, and then the head of Newsweek put his arm around Bob, and he said, now Bob, sometimes, sometimes you have to do what's best for the country. Oh, <laughs> Gentlemanly laughter, all gentlemanly, 
all laughing, ha, ha, ha. Sometimes you have to do what's best for the country. That's what the New York Times did when James Risen had the goods on George Bush in 2004, four months before the re-election, and they knew what's best for the country, so they refused to let James Risen tell the American people that all of us were being surveilled against the Fourth Amendment. They knew what's best for the country. And, the, and the, you know, the, the guys that work as the journalists, well, they know that these guys know what's best for the country. They self-censor, and they're really a disgrace to the profession, if you don't mind my saying so. Thank you. And that is the last word. <laughs> thank you. It's, um, thank you all. We have, uh, time just got out of control for me, so I, I don't know if I did my moderating very, very well. But thank you. Thank you anyway. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. I want to thank All Souls, all Souls Church and the, um, the coffee party. It's been a wonderful evening. Thank you all. Good night. Uh, to answer one question about the uh, video for this evening, if you go to uh, BigAppleCoffeeParty.org, It'll be up in, in, in a few days. If you want to know exactly when it's coming up and you haven't signed up for our email list, do so on your way out and you'll be notified as soon as it's posted. Thank you.